right, well, um, I'm really excited to begin this study on the Pilgrim's Progress. And so you've heard me talk about it some on Sunday mornings and other times, and uh, uh, here we are. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a little bit of an introduction uh, before we jump into it. So first of all, just uh, personally, um, the first time I read Pilgrim's Progress was probably about 10 years ago, and I actually didn't really like it a whole lot at first. Um, uh, I think I read it for a seminary class, and then another time I listened through it, and uh, just over the years, it's really, really grown on me. And uh, I think maybe uh, as I've matured in the faith, and, and just as I've seen more and more connections uh, with this story and the scriptures, um, it's, uh, it's really just been uh, very beneficial for me, and it's helped me grow in the faith. Um, and then, you know, having kids, uh, we've, we've gone through this book right here, which is, this is uh, uh, something I'm going to be quoting from a lot. This is basically an abridged version of Pilgrim's Progress, and it's illustrated. Now, it's very much abridged. It's just uh, excerpts from it that are kind of all put together, but that's been helpful to go through with the kids. And so uh, I'll read through it. I'll even show you the pictures uh, as we're, as we're uh, going through this study. Uh, but I have here the uh, full edition here. And there's all kinds of different versions, you know, modern English versions and, uh, you know, the uh, original. Uh, it was written in the 1600s. And so uh, the language is kind of archaic. And, and actually in this children's version, uh, the language is pretty archaic. Um, but uh, I think we can, we can handle it. And it actually kind of adds to it a little bit. It reminds you of of the uh, antiquity of it. But Pilgrim's Progress was written in the 1600s uh, by a man named John Bunyan. And uh, John Bunyan was a Baptist, and uh, he was imprisoned for it. In fact, he was in prison when he started uh, writing Pilgrim's Progress in 1664. And so uh, he lived in England, and, uh, and then you couldn't preach without a license. And he didn't have a license because he was a Baptist, and so he didn't hold to the views of the Church of England. And so uh, he was imprisoned uh, for the first time for actually 12 years, which that seems like a pretty hefty sentence uh, for preaching. Uh, but, uh, uh, but he uh, paid that price uh, for his convictions and for his um, uh, uh, you know, urge to preach the gospel. And so he began arriving Pilgrim's Progress in 1664. Uh, the first edition was published in 1678. I think that was shortly after he got out of prison. Uh, but then there was an expanded edition that had just some more characters and uh, kind of filled out the story a little bit more in uh, 1679. And that was after he was released from a second imprisonment, which was, which was just for six months. And so, uh, I don't know, we kind of think of, you know, Paul and, and his writing the epistles, some, some of the epistles from prison. Uh, we have kind of a similar thing with John Bunyan. And I think it kind of adds to the story when we think about how he suffered for his faith because in in this story this allegory of the Christian life there's a lot of pain and suffering that uh, Christian the main character goes through uh, so Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory of the Christian life and uh, I'm just going to uh, read from the beginning um, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip places as, as we go through this and I'm gonna of course uh, give my own comments, but I am going to do a, a decent amount of reading from this because I think it's important to kind of get a, a taste of, of it from John Bunyan himself. So here's how it begins. As I walked through the wilderness of this world, I lighted on a certain place and laid me down to sleep. And as I slept, I dreamed a dream. I dreamed that I saw a man with his face turned away from his own house, a book in his hand, and a great burden on his back. I looked and I saw him open the book and read therein. And as he read, he wept and trembled. And not being able to contain himself, he broke out with a lamentable cry saying, what shall I do to be saved? And I'll pause right there. Um, does that phrase sound familiar to you? Anybody remember who it was that said that in the scriptures? Well, uh, so, so, so I'm thinking, the, the phrase actually, I guess, comes in different forms from different characters, but I'm thinking of the Philippian jailer, right? Um, but yeah, the, the, uh, the, the rich man that comes to Jesus says something similar. Uh, but uh, yeah, what, what must I do or what shall I do to be saved? And uh, that really is the question that kind of sets the whole story up. 
right? And so, uh, so Christian has this book in his hand, which is the Bible, and uh, he has this burden on his back. So there's a picture there of Christian with his burden. And this burden represents sin and the burden he feels uh, for his sin. All right, so Christian says, What shall I do to be saved? For he lived in the city of destruction, which he learnt from his book was doomed to be burned with fire from heaven, in which fearful overthrow both himself and his wife and their four sons would miserably perish, unless some way of escape could be found. So Christian, for that was his name, went home to talk to his family, and they were greatly worried, not because they believed that what he said was true, but because they thought some kind of madness had gotten into the poor man. And it was... And as it was drawing towards night, they hoped that sleep might settle his brains. With all haste, they put him to bed. And so that's him with his family. And uh, here he is in his distressed state in bed. It says, but night was as troublesome to him as the day. Wherefore, instead of sleeping, he spent it in sighs and tears. So when morning came and they asked him how he was, he told them, worse worse. He also started talking to them again, but they began to lose patience. Sometimes they would deride him, sometimes they would chide him, and sometimes they would quite neglect him. So Christian went by himself into the fields, still reading his book and carrying his burden, and greatly distressed in his mind. He looked this way and that way, as if he could run, yet he stood still because he couldn't tell which way to go. Then in the distance he saw a man approaching him. His name was Evangelist. There's Christian there. His name was Evangelist, and he asked Christian, What are you weeping for? Sir, he answered, This book in my hands tells me to flee from the wrath to come. Also I fear that this burden which is upon my back will sink me lower than the grave. Therefore I need to get rid of it. If this is so, said Evangelist, then why are you standing still? Because I don't know where to go, he answered. Then Evangelist pointed with his finger over to a wide field. Do you see yonder wicked gate, he asked. No, said Christian. Then do you see a shining light? I think I do, said Christian. Then said Evangelist, keep that light in your eye and go in that direction so you shall reach the gate. There, when you knock, it will be told of you what to do. So I saw in my dream that the man began to run. But he hadn't run far before his wife and children saw him running and called after him to return. But the man put his fingers in his ears and ran on. He didn't look back, but ran towards the middle of the plain. The neighbors, too, came out to see him run. And as he ran, some mocked and others threatened. A couple of them were resolved to fetch him back by force. The name of the one was obstinate, and the name of the other was pliable. Now by this time, the man had gone a good distance from them. Nevertheless, they pursued after him and overtook him. So I'll pause there for a moment. Um, we see here uh, that salvation begins with conviction of sin. And uh, I think this is uh, something huge that we see in Pilgrim's Progress. Of course, we see this burden on Christian's back, and he's going to carry this burden for a long time. We, we, we see the distress that he has uh, because of his sin. And uh, this was somewhat autobiographical for, for Bunyan, um, because uh, Bunyan uh, was under conviction of sin for uh, he says for about 18 months uh, uh, leading up to his conversion. So it began with the sermon that he heard. And, uh, and then what really kind of uh, put the nail in the coffin, I guess, was when he, he was in the market and there was a woman of ill repute that chastised him for his bad language. And, uh, and, and something about that just uh, kind of made him begin to feel the weight of his sin, but it was, it was a good 18 months before uh, he came to that point of conversion. It's important for us to catch uh, the biblical references in this, and so pointed out one already, um, but there's another. What, what about this, this wicked gate? 
What do you think that's referring to? The, uh, the narrow gate. Or la later he calls it the little wicket gate. Um, Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. And so what we see in the Pilgrim's Progress is that um, the, the road to conversion, it, it can be a journey or, or a pilgrimage. But we'll see that it doesn't, it doesn't end at conversion, uh, but uh, the whole Christian life is a journey or a pilgrimage. It's persevering in the faith. And, and I think that's one of the huge benefits of Pilgrim's Progress, especially in our day, because a lot of people do not see the Christian life as this pilgrimage where you have to fight to persevere. Um, they, they might see it like, well, you know, you, you say a prayer, uh, you ask Jesus to forgive your sins, and then, you know, you try to be a good person and you go to church or maybe you don't go to church, but, you know, you, you just kind of go on with your life. But, you know, you prayed this prayer, you asked Jesus to forgive your sins, and so that's it. Um, it's, uh, you know, oftentimes we, we use the phrase, or not me personally, but, uh, but in our Baptist tradition, uh, you hear the phrase, once saved, always saved. And I've told you guys before that I'm not a big fan of that, uh, even though it is true, right, that once a person is truly born again, once a person is justified, um, they're going to, uh, well, they're going to persevere in the faith. That's, that's why I think perseverance of the saints is a better term, and that's the more historical term that's used. It's that if you truly are born again, that you will persevere. But as we've often talked about, there, there's this uh, mystery in that, we are to work at our, our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God working in us to work and to will for his good pleasure. Right? So, so, so we have this responsibility to fight uh, for the faith, to, 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 to stay in the faith, to persevere in the faith. And, and, uh, and, it's, and it really is uh, quite the journey, quite the pilgrimage, if we are to uh, live our lives as Christians, as uh, the scriptures lay out for us. And so, so I think that there can be kind of a, maybe a shallow understanding of perseverance of the saints, uh, or, you know, to use the phrase, once saved, always saved, that, that keeps people from, from seeing the, the weight of the Christian life, that it really is this pilgrimage that uh, has all kinds of temptations, all kinds of dangers, uh, all kinds of discouragements, but also many joys, and, uh, and ultimately this great reward to come which is the celestial city, which Christian is heading to. So he goes through this wicked gate, but the ultimate destination is the celestial city. We see, we see right from the beginning that Christian has uh, some worldly opposition. So, so you've, you've noticed by now that, uh, that the characters, they have names that describe their character, right? So we have Christian, uh, we have evangelist, and now we have uh, these two men, obstinate and pliable. So obstinate and, pli and pliable represent uh, to us this worldly opposition. And so obstinate and pliable, they come after Christian, and Christian says to them, he says, Neighbors, why have you come? And they say, to persuade you to come back with us. And so uh, obstinate, uh, well, he's, he's very firm in his opposition, and uh, he's very stubborn, he's very obstinate. And so when Christian tells him he's not going back, and in fact Christian invites him and pliable to come along, obstinate, he's like, all right, I'm out, I'm going back. All right, obstinate, goes, obstinate goes back. Uh, but then pliable, well, he's pliable. Uh, he's malleable. He, he's, he's easily swayed. And so pliable tags along until they come to the slough of despond, or we might call it the swamp of despair, something like that. Um, so they come to this, they come to this swamp and they, they, they fall into it. All right. And, uh, it's interesting because pliable, uh, he doesn't hardly sink, but Christian, he sinks rather quickly. Why do you think that is? Yes. Uh, Christian has this burden on his back. So he sinks pliable, you know, he struggles there in, in the, in the slough or in the swamp. Uh, but, but pliable gets out. Uh, pretty quickly, and uh, and and he's he's done after that. Let me we'll flip a few pages here, and I'll 
read some from that account. So after they uh, fall into this swamp, Pliable says this. He says, neighbor Christian, where are you? Truly, I do not know, Christian replied. And so Pliable began to be offended and angrily said to his fellow, is this the happiness you promised me? If we have such ill speed at our first setting out, what may we expect between this and our journey's end? With that, having no burden to contend with, Pliable scrambled out on that side of the slough which was nearest to his house. And so he ran off home for a hot bath, leaving Christian to his fate. For his part, Christian was struggling to reach the side of the slough nearest to the wicket gate, which he eventually did, but he couldn't clamber out by reason of the burden on his back. And so, of course, this can represent, um, you know, depression, uh, despair, sorrow that, uh, that may come upon us in the Christian life. And it hits Christian quite soon, doesn't it? Uh, but we see Pliable, he goes back. Um, we, can, we can think in biblical terms of, of Pliable as the seed that falls on rocky ground. So remember the parable of the seeds that Jesus gives, and you know some seed lands on the path, some lands on rocky ground, some among the thorns, some have been good soil. And um, Jesus, when he explains the parable, he says this of the seed that falls on the rocky ground. He says, as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the world, immediately he falls away. That's pliable, isn't it? Or it may be, you know, the person in the revival who raises his hand, I see that hand, and he says a prayer. It's not to say that God can't use that kind of thing, because God does often use that kind of thing uh, to truly set a person on the path uh, to where they truly are born again and they persevere to the end. Uh, but, but we see that there are people who are pliable. So we've talked about this in the outreach committee, about how sometimes people that you talk with personally, you ask them questions, well, do you believe in Jesus? Oh, yeah, yeah, I believe. And, and they, just, they just say what you want to hear, right? So they're very pliable. And, and so they might make a profession of faith, and maybe they even do believe it to some degree, um, and maybe they, can get, they get really, really excited about it, uh, but they don't last very long. That's what pliable represents. I think, I think a, a problem, maybe especially for our day and time, is that, uh, that, that character pliable. So here in the Pilgrim's Progress, you know, he turns around and he goes back home. So it seems like maybe Pliable here recognizes that, okay, I'm not a Christian. This isn't for me. But I think sometimes uh, with the way that we might present the gospel, uh, with what many have called easy believism, just this kind of thing, like you, know, you say a prayer, you, you, you check this mark on, on, a, on a card or whatever, and you're good, they, they might very well turn back like Pliable, and yet they have this false assurance that, okay, well, you know, I said a prayer, I believe in Jesus, well, you believe in God, even the demons believe in God, and they shudder. The demons also believe that Jesus died and rose again. They were there, right? And so, so of course, it's more than just intellectual assent. Uh, but, but oftentimes, um, people can be given this false assurance. And so, so we want to be careful about that, right? Uh, again, this is something I think we learn from the Pilgrim's Progress in that we want to present the Christian life as, as a dangerous journey. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, yeah. Yeah. Well. So. So. So he comes across different characters in in the book. Um, so some characters hinder him. Some characters help him. Um, so, but those characters who hinder him, no, they don't have the burden. And those who help them, uh, well, they've already lost the burden because because Christian is going to lose this burden off of his back. And so those those who help him have have already uh, lost this burden. What? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, so, uh, but, uh, but we'll see, even, even in this section today, that um, Mr. Worldly Wise Man, uh, he, he tries to give uh, Christian a way to get the burden off of his back, um, and so he says, oh, I've seen this before. So, so yes, there, there's an allusion to others who have had this burden, um, but uh, he's the only character that we see actually carrying this, this burden. All right, so, um, so yeah, we have, we have uh, characters who 
hinder and those who help. So first of all, we saw evangelist. That's a good character. And here's another one. There's a guy named Help. And so Help comes and he helps Christian out of, out of the, the slough of despond. So, so actually, like as we, as we read through and think about the Pilgrim's Progress, of course, we want to think of how we relate to Christian, but we can also think about how, you know, what our role might be in helping other pilgrims, right? Are you evangelist or are you help? Uh, you know, maybe helping somebody out of a tough time in life. Um, later, we're going to, uh, next week, we'll get to the interpreter's house, which uh, I think that's uh, much my job as, as a pastor, right? I help people to interpret and understand the scriptures. And, and so, and of course, uh, it's not that we stick to one and one only, right? Uh, we all have responsibilities, I think, in all of these areas, but uh, maybe primarily you might fall into one of these categories, and there's many others to come. So, um, so help uh, takes Christian out of the uh, slough of despond, but then we come to the next character that I just mentioned a moment ago, which is Mr. Worldly Wise Man. So I'm going to read some more from here. Here's what Mr. Worldly Wise Man looks like. <clears throat> Although he didn't know it, worse trouble lay in store. For a certain Mr. Worldly Wise Man was now seen crossing the fields to meet him. He dwelt in the town of Carnal Policy, a very great town, hard by where Christian lived. This man, then, having some inkling of him, for Christian's departure from the city of destruction was much noised abroad, he began to question him. How now, good fellow, where are you going with that great burden? I'm going to yonder wicked gate. Have you a wife and children? asked Mr. Worldly Wise Man. Why, yes, replied Christian. But I am so heavily weighed down, I can't take pleasure in them anymore. Who counseled you to start up this dangerous journey? A man that came to me, his name, I remember, was Evangelist. I thought as much, said worldly wise man. He is forever leading travelers astray. For no more difficult road in the world than the one he's directed, sorry, there's no more difficult road in the world than the one that he's directed you to. I see by the dirt on you that you've already been in the slough of despond. But that slough is only the beginning of your troubles. And the way you are going, you are likely to encounter far worse things than this. Lions, dragons, darkness, and death. This has been confirmed by many witnesses. So why should a man so carelessly risk his life by giving heed to a stranger? After pausing for breath, Mr. Worldly Wise Man proceeded as follows. Hear me. I'm older than you. I'll give you some advice. In yonder village, there dwells a gentleman whose name is Legality, a very judicious man, a man of very good name. He has skill to help men off with their burdens. He has, to my knowledge, cured several who were going out of their wits because of them. His house is not a mile from this place, and if he's not at home himself, his son, who's called Civility, will help you. Moreover, if you wish, there are houses standing empty in the village at reasonable rates. The food is cheap and good. And you can send for your wife and family and all live happily together. Now, that may not have been what you expected uh, to hear from Mr. Worldly Wise Man. Uh, he, he, he's leading him to a path of morality, right? Uh, to go to Mr. Legality's house. Um, we see as, as we read on that Worldly Wise Man points Christian to a hill but once he arrives, he comes to find that it is a fearsome mountain, has steep overhangs and, and uh, dark clouds, flashes of fire. Uh, I think it uh, represents Mount Sinai. And so, so, so he, he's, he's already kind of fooled, right? He, he's told that it's a hill, but he gets there and it's this fearsome mountain. And he's told that you know, this is a way that his burden can be relieved. But we know that uh, that's, uh, that's not the case. Romans 3.23, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Or we can think of the uh, familiar hymn, uh, Rock of Ages. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All could never sin erase. Thou must save 
and save by grace. So um, Christian is not going to be able to truly remove this burden from his back. Now, some people uh, may be fooled into thinking that all is well if they uh, go down this path, if they uh, go the way of Mr. Legality. Uh, but, but truly, uh, the works of the law uh, is, is not what's going to save us. You know, the message in the New Testament is that salvation is a free gift, free gift from God. And yet, it will cost you everything. We kind of see that tension, don't we? Right? We, 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 we see that uh, there's nothing we can do to earn our salvation, right? Uh, if, if, if we seek to attain it by works of the law, we will be condemned before God because none of us can measure up. But we also see that, uh, you know, the, the scriptures do not present to us a kind of easy believism. I mean, what did Jesus himself say? He said, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Or he tells us to take up our cross. And then no one, he says, no one can be my disciple unless he takes up his cross daily and follows me. And so we have, we have these demands of the Christian life, this pilgrimage, right? Uh, but again, this, uh, specifically this verse, consider whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Christian was tempted to save his life by moralism, right? He's like, you know, if, if you stay here, your family can come and all will be well. You just kind of go this path of legality. You don't need Jesus. You don't, you don't need to follow after Christ. Uh, you, you don't need to, um, to do these things, to, to, to go in the narrow path. But you just set up your home here. But that can't save. Only Jesus can save. And so, Christian, he's making his way up this mountain. And uh, thankfully, he runs into evangelist once again. At that moment, who should appear but evangelist, coming to meet him with a severe and dreadful countenance, at the sight of which Christian began to blush with, sh with shame. Aren't you the man I found weeping outside the city of destruction? Questioned evangelist. Yes, dear sir, I am the man. Did not I direct you to the little wicket gate? Yes, dear sir, replied Christian. How is it then that you've so quickly turned aside? I, I met, you see, a gentleman, and he persuaded me that I might find in the village before me a man who could take off my burden. He said, moreover, he would show me a better way, not so attended with difficulties as the way, sir, that you set me in. Then said evangelist, stand still a little. And so he stood trembling. And evangelist said, you have rejected the word of God for the advice of Mr. Worldly Wiseman. But Mr. Legality cannot free you of your burden. Mr. Legality is a cheat. As for his son's civility, notwithstanding his simpering looks, he cannot help you either. As he spoke, there was a great clap of thunder. And Christian called himself a thousand fools for listening to Mr. Worldly Wiseman. I am sorry that I ever hearkened to this man's counsel, he said, turning back with haste. He spoke to no one on the way, nor if anybody asked him, would he give them an answer. He went like one that was all the while treading on forbidden ground and could by no means think himself safe till he had reigned the road, till he had regained the road that he had abandoned. But would he ever reach it? He wasn't all sure, for narrow is the gate it says in the book, and few are they who find it. So um, Christian, as he continues on his journey, he finally makes it to the little wicket gate. And uh, above the door of the gate were the words, knock and it shall be opened to you. Of course, those are the words of Jesus. And uh, so Christian knocks on the door, and uh, a man named Goodwill opens the door. Well, first he says, who's there? Christian responds, he says, I'm, I'm a poor, burdened traveler. And he, he tells of, of his situation. He says, are you willing to let me in? And Goodwill says, I am willing with all my heart. And Goodwill pulls him in. And, and most understand Goodwill to be Jesus himself. If not goodwill in the gate, all right, Jesus says, I am the door, right? So, so, so one or the other, but this is representing Christ and, and, and Christian being pulled in 
through the gate. And so, so this seems to be the point of salvation for Christian. Now, some debate this a little bit because uh, Christian's burden still doesn't fall off. Um, it, it, it doesn't fall. I, I'll give another. I'll give a spoiler here. So, so next week um, uh, we'll see that he continues and he goes to the house of the interpreter. And, and there are many different lessons that he sees in the house of the interpreter that help him understand better uh, the Christian faith. And then from there, uh, he goes up to a hill, and, and there at the cross, his burden falls off. It rolls down the hill into an empty tomb. And there he's given a parchment that's, that's sealed. And, uh, and I, I understand this parchment to represent his assurance. And, and even the burden falling off his back represents his assurance. And so, like I said, there's a little bit of debate here, but, but it seems as, as he comes in through this narrow gate that this is the point of his salvation. Um, but, uh, you know, a, a person can be saved, but still has to um, understand the, the, the teachings a little bit more and, and, and come to that point to where they really do feel released of the burden of sin. And so I think that's what we see with Christian. Um, I don't... Uh, We've got a little bit of time, but that's, that's, uh, that's as much as I have for tonight. But if you have any questions or comments, we can, we can discuss them right now. So anything at all? All right. Well, uh, I hope that this has been uh, helpful for you. And so, uh, so we're going to have six sessions of this. And, uh, and then once we get to the end, we'll watch that animated film. Um, and so, uh, so again, next, next week, uh, I think we'll, we'll go from the interpreter. Well, I'm not quite sure where we'll end, but, but yeah, that's where we'll begin is with the house of the interpreter. So let me close this with a, a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for uh, this powerful story and mostly how it represents to us so many wonderful truths from Scripture. And so help us to understand those, for those to um, be planted deep in our hearts, Lord. Help us to take serious uh, the call to perseverance and, and just the gospel itself. And help us to learn uh, the many lessons that, uh, that are here for us in this story. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.